We are at the beginning of week three of rehearsal for Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill. Generally the week where, you know, everything goes wrong and then comes good again. But so far, not much is going wrong. Basically, the premise of the show is one of, if not the last performance that Billie Holiday gives before she passes away. And it's set in a bar in Philadelphia, like a jazz club in Philadelphia in 1959. It's a balancing act between a dramatization of a person from history, <laughs> a person that actually existed, uh, and a gig. I say I care forever. Many of those kind of bio shows of famous artists are kind of, you know, Wikipedia shows like they were born, they did this, they were raised. And, but because this is set over one evening, there's so much about Billie Holiday's life encapsulated in this show, but the form of it is actually really interesting. In the way that it is melding between a gig and a play, the audience is really the other character in the story, right? And there's a lot of it is talking directly to the audience. I'm not supposed to tell it, but Jimmy and me is going to get married. As soon as my next divorce comes through. Ain't that right, Jimmy? <laughs> I think a lot of the audience will go, what's happening? This is not how a cabaret show normally goes. But in this one, there's so many kind of beautifully awkward moments as Billy kind of heads into kind of crisis land in the show. It's always difficult performing a person who is real. <laughs> you know, there's pressure and you also want to honor that, you know, that it's, a, it's, not, it's not a made up person in somebody's head. This person lived and had a life. The voice coach on the show, Geraldine Cook, along with me, you know, we've been looking very much at trying to find primary sources, you know, of Billy speaking particularly, because there isn't actually a lot of resources of her just chatting. Well, Billy, there's one question I wanted to ask you. Where did you get the name Lady Day? I got it from my saxophone player, a name Lester Young. They call him Prez. I sort of named him Prez. He named me Lady and my mother, the Duchess. Uh, she often referenced the fact that she loved the blues, she loved Bessie Smith, she loved Louis Armstrong, and really what she was trying to do was be an instrument. She really wanted to contribute to the band, and so a lot of the qualities that we hear in her voice are her attempts to do that, to sound like a horn. So for me, it's about also in trying to, I guess, honor her, <laughs> is looking at the things that were influencing her. I'm on stage with three musicians. You know, I have to remind myself, I keep thinking of it as a one-person show, but it's not really, there's four of us on stage. So at the moment, we've got Kim Perling, who's our pianist, who's also the MD for the show. He's the music director for the show. And Kim is amazing, very, very experienced, wonderful jazz player. And it was important, I think, for Mitchell and for myself, because I'm not, I'm not a jazz musician, I'm an actor. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs, you know, I don't know all that. That's not my speciality. It was really important to have somebody in the room who's very au fait with that stuff. Crazy calls me, sure I'm crazy. I wanted to do the show for a number of reasons. A, to kind of platform the talent of people like Zara, but B, I'm interested in looking at shows that kind of deal with um, social issues and the notion of social change, but in a way that's not didactic. The birth of the civil rights movement is in here. The kind of divide between black and white in America, which still exists today, is part of the conversation in this show. Poverty, sexual assault, conversations about addiction, they're all part of this show, but, but it never feels like a kind of op-ed piece or a TED talk. I think a lot of what people remember about her sometimes is, you know, oh, she was like into drugs and she did a lot of drugs and 
that's a shame if that's the only thing that people hang on to. I think it's really important to highlight that she was an amazing practitioner. She was very skilled and she was fully aware and I guess engaged in a robust dialogue with the conditions in which she lived in. You know, I think sometimes people forget that she was singing Strange Fruit, which essentially is, um, you know, a, now is seen as like a, a civil rights, you know, a, a seminal moment in, in the civil rights movement. She was singing that in the 30s. Black bodies swinging in the stars of breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. She was one of the few African-American female singers um, with an all-white band. You know, she was touring with all-white musicians through a segregated South. You know, having to sing in venues where people are like clapping you, but they also don't want you to walk in the front door. She talks in the show about singing is living to me. Singing, without singing, I'm, I'm kind of nothing. And I'm kind of interested in that notion of art being the thing that pulls someone through life, no matter what your challenges are. The kind of beauty and transcendence that comes from art is something that I think did pull Billy right through her life. You know, she's she's fun, man. She's got gags, you know? She's, she's a real, she's not a downer and she doesn't see herself as a, as a victim. And I think it's that, a person who doesn't allow themselves to be a victim, but in listening to their story, that's when you get, you know, that's when you get affected by it because it's like, man, how did you do and survive all of those things? Mm -hmm.